everyone. I am GeekWire co-founder John Cook, and on behalf of the entire GeekWire team, welcome to today's virtual roundtable. We've got a great session today talking to leading chief financial officers to get a sense of how they are navigating these turbulent times. We were absolutely overwhelmed by the audience questions that came in on this topic, so we know we're going to have a great discussion. I think we had over 100 questions submitted. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of those, but we'll do our best during the Q&A portion towards the latter part of the session to answer as many of those questions that came in. This is part of an ongoing series of virtual events we're hosting at GeekWire Studios as we bring the community together to dive deep into the issues that matter in business, technology, and society. And speaking of big events coming up, we've got our biggest of the year, the GeekWire Summit. So I'm gonna put a shameless plug in for our big GeekWire Summit, which is coming up next month. Yes, we're going fully virtual. We're actually spreading the event over three weeks, having it in bite-sized chunks from October 13th to October 29th. And we've got great speakers like Peter Kern, the CEO of Expedia, the head of data research at Fred Hutch, talking about COVID-19 and many other issues. So make sure to tune into the GeekWire Summit and you can go to geekwire.com slash summit to learn more about that event. And we'll follow up today's session with an email with additional information about that. Finally, a shout out to our GeekWire members who are joining us today. Your membership helps fuel our daily journalism and covering the Northwest tech community. If you're not yet an individual or a corporate member, go to geekwire.com slash memberships to learn more. And a big thanks to our sponsors today, our great friends at Aptio and EY for helping to put on this session. Now let's meet our panel. Tracy Knox is the CFO of online pet sitting marketplace Rover, who previously served as CFO at publicly traded companies, including Rightside and drugstore.com. Chad Cohen is the CFO at Adaptive Biotechnologies, a fast growing Seattle biotech company that went public last year. And Chad is also the former CFO of Zillow Group and before that worked at Ticketmaster and EY. And finally, Kurt Schintaffer, the co-founder and CFO at Aptio, a cloud-based financial management software company that's based in Bellevue. Our session today will be moderated by Tim Tasker, the managing partner for the Seattle office of EY. And with that, take it away, Tim. Well, great. Well, thank you, John, and welcome, everybody. Hey, I just want to thank you, John, and your whole team at GeekWire for helping us keep connected here uh, during this 2020 uh, through these sessions and others. So thank you very much. You know, no doubt 2020 has been an amazing year and has required all of us to be flexible and resourceful. In addition to the pandemic, the need to understand and acknowledge there isn't that it isn't enough not to be racist, but to be anti-racist, the protest and now the fires. Leading our people and families has just been monumental for all of us, especially these, these CFOs. Uh, I want to share a story. I was reminded the other day of, uh, by, a, by a friend who shared a story with me that I thought explained 2020 in for all of us and and you all may be able to relate to this but i had a friend's sister who had to leave early for work the other day and left her first grader with older siblings and this first grader by himself logged on to his class it was roll call he he said he was there and then all of a sudden logged off well what did he do he went to the kitchen to get a big bowl of ice cream and um, while resourceful, he didn't remember to log back on, and unfortunately for him, the teacher called his mom. But I, I was thinking, that is very resourceful for a six-year-old, and all of us have had to do that. So um, kids are all constantly teaching us here. It, I think it's also important to recognize that the events of 2020 has impacted companies very differently, depending on your stage of development, depending on your industry. We've all, we've all have had difficulties, but all have been at different levels. Um, I thought it was interesting that when I look back to look at the VC funding that our firm has, has researched, in August alone, 14 Seattle-based companies raised over $140 million. In July, that was $456 million for over 17 fundings. 
So investors are still investing. So I'm an optimist and I still think this will continue uh, in our region. But with that, let's get to our panelists. To, uh, we, again, thank you for all your questions. And to kick us off, why, why don't we um, have our panelists talk about how has the pandemic changed your role as a CFO? And maybe interested, interesting to share some of the leadership lessons you've had over the past year. Um, Tracy, do you wanna start, start sure. with that? Sure, thanks Tim. Um, as you said, I think that um, it depends on your industry and your stage, but we, I think everyone has learned leadership lessons this year. Um, from the, the likes of Amazon or Peloton who had to figure out how to ramp up production and um, their inventory quickly to satisfy the demand to companies like Rover, where the phrase prepare for the worst and hope for the best has never been more acutely felt. Um, for, for us personally, the last six months has been quite the journey. Um, and two of the leadership lessons that I've really learned, um, and, and I'll talk about a third as well, is the ability to pivot. I think as a CFO, you know, we, we went into this year and the first two months we were uh, surpassing our plan. And then we started to get a little bit nervous when we saw the COVID cases creep up. And so we pivoted very quickly. Um, and that's the other one, you need to act fast. So about uh, the first week of March, we decided we, we were nervous about the economy. We weren't yet nervous about our business. I mean, a little bit, but nervous that banks were gonna um, not have the ability to fund our debt, our, um, our debt facilities. So we pulled all of our debt, even though we didn't need it at that time, because we thought, well, it's better to have the cash. Um, and Goldman Sachs CFO gave me great advice one time um, at a conference, which was as the CFO, your number one rule is to never run out of cash because nothing else you do matters. And so it was about mid-March when we realized that was really important because our business fell off a cliff, probably similar to the rest of the travel industry and many other companies. And um, so we pivoted to quick planning um, and figuring out what's our runway look like. And what we realized very quickly is if this is extended, we need to reduce our operating expense load ASAP. And so we cut off all paid marketing and we made the very, very difficult decision to um, enact a reduction in force, 50% um, of our workforce, but all with the goal of we just need to survive however long this lasts. So pivot, act fast. And then the other, I think the third one is just communication with the board and um, investors actually. Uh, because they saw the news coming out. And so it's really, you know, the board was lockstep with us all the way, but the investors, we had to be proactive at reaching out um, to give them a sense of comfort as to what we were doing. So for me, it was pivot, act fast, and um, communicate, over communicate. Yeah. Thank you for that, Tracy. I, I, I think uh, you mentioned one thing a lot of companies did, and that was draw down as much cash as, as they had on their credit lines too. Because at in March, we didn't know how long this was going to last. We didn't know what was, was going on. Chad, Kurt, um, any, any uh, thoughts from you in, in terms of uh, what you've learned in the past six months? I'm happy to jump in and let's go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, sim similar to, to Tracy, I would say like for us, it became a question of first health and safety of our em employees and how do we orient to making sure that they're healthy and safe and you know immediately started thinking about how do we one incubate uh all the innovation that's going on at adaptive because in many ways we're still a embryonic or nascent uh, early stage product and commercialization business where most of our inflection points are out you know, many quarters or many years from now, right? We're in this, in this platform story, in this growth story. So how do we in, in, uh, incubate all of that innovation that's happening? Um, two, we have very sick patients that rely on adaptive for a diagnosis of, an ongoing diagnosis of their illnesses. And so how do we incubate the lab itself and the employees in the lab to continue to do their jobs and deliver results back to these sick patients. And so those from a high level were very important to us and became sort of the, 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 our, our top priorities. When, when it comes to you know, my role as CFO of the company, the, the, the questions that we were asking ourselves was, and it's hard to speculate, right? Because we've never been through a pandemic before. I think all of us have seen 
uh, but, you know, some of us have been through the dot com dot com bust, uh, the mortgage crisis, and these things usually last you know a year or two, generally speaking. That, you know, and you come out out come out of them. But no one's been through a pandemic, and so the the question is, you know, how deep is the trough and how long is that trough? Is is hard to speculate. So we started running a number of sensitivity analyses around what the bottom of that trough would potentially look like. What would that do to our revenues? What would that do to our, our cash flows? We're still a loss generating company at this point. Um, but preservation of capital is in, in, in incredibly important to us and making sure we've got enough runway to do what we need to do and execute on our longer term objectives. So we tried to just given all of that and given where we are in the commercialization of the business, stay really long-term focused and not give up on where we think these big inflection points and value creation points are for the company. So ensuring that we've got a, the right amount of capital to execute, we actually um, visited the markets back in July and raised another $300 million to really incubate and actually press the gas on uh, some of those, um, sort of inflection points that are out a little ways and try to say, hey, can we bring them in? We're particularly focused on using our diagnostic platform as a way to also diagnose COVID. And so there's huge value in able to bring a new type of T-cell diagnostic to the market. So how can we accelerate that with additional capital and additional resources? So allocation of capital for us became a really big issue and understanding where we could press our advantage and where we might have some pressure on the business where we want to take a pause and take those resources and allocate them to, again, other ways that we think we can deliver value to our, our current and future customers. Yeah, I think one of the takeaways that I have sitting here uh, six months or so past the, the start of, of COVID-19, at least as it impacted our business, was um, we all set 2020 plans and most of those plans for most of us are, are out the door at this point. Then we reforecast the business, and I bet a lot of us were pretty wrong as it related to the reforecast. And as CFOs, there was a bit of a, we sort of got a pass because, shoot, it's COVID-19, this is hard, we don't know which end is up. But what I see coming out the other side of this is boards having higher expectations of us to be able to react more quickly when things like this happen. Um, you know, God forbid something like this happens again, um, I should be better prepared. We should be better prepared with, with the, the scenario planning that Chad was mentioning, with understanding what levers to pull, where to, where to get conservative, where to pressure advantage. And so I think for, for us, the challenge will be, um, I don't think we have the luxury to say, thank goodness most of that's in the rear view mirror. We now have to say, well, how would we react to some other thing that I can't even imagine sitting here today? I, I think in a lot of cases, Kurt, maybe, it felt like the board was looking to the CFO as a bit of a river guide through the process, right? How do you think we should approach this? What have you seen in your experience that's worked when there's been uncertainty in the markets or uncertainty, um, you know, with, with forecasts? I mean, we, we pulled guidance as it relates to, <clears throat> we, we've generally provided guidance to the, to the street, but just given the uncertainty and our ability to really speculate um, being challenged, we, we had to pull guidance. Um, but it didn't mean that we weren't spending a lot of time and effort thinking about, you know, what this business might look like, you know, in the next four to six quarters, right? And so the board is looking to the CFO as a bit of a river guide to say, hey, these are uncharted sort of territories. What have you seen in, your, in, in the past that's worked in terms of sensitizing the business to high degrees of uncertainty into crises? And uh, at least at Adaptive, that's, you know, they... They turn to me and other members of the executive team, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably the same at, at, at Aptio and at, at, at Rover. Yeah. yeah well, all and, three and of that, you, sorry, Kurt, go ahead. Oh, and, and to your point, uh, Chad, there was, this, there was this focus initially on liquidity, like, like Tracy was mentioning, pull down your revolver, make sure you're liquid, and, but they didn't want us to focus on just the, the kind of the, the, the protectionary uh, side of being a CFO. Quickly, they, they started turning to, where should we invest? Where, you know, where, 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 where might we be more um, better positioned than our competitors with whether it's the capital we have or the market position we have to actually take an advantage right now or, or, or capitalize on an advantage we have where, while other people are maybe slower to move or more risk averse in this environment? 
Yeah, so all, all three of you mentioned scenario planning and it, it sounded fairly short term. From a long term perspective, in, pre in preparing for, for this uh, session today, I looked up in July, GeekWire conducted a survey of about 37 CFOs. Three quarters of the respondents expected their business to fully recover after experience some setbacks. And almost half said they were increasing their 2020 spending forecast. So as we sit here two months away, <clears throat> you, you got through the first three months, five months, six months, um, we're two months past the survey and uh, many of the uncertainties remain. So how, when you think about long-term planning and capitalizing on opportunities, um, can you provide some insight to the, to the group on what your thinking is around that and how you're approaching it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So first of all, I'm, I'm, it's amazing that 50% of the folks in the survey or CFOs in the survey said they were gonna increase spending. I, I would like to be in their, in their industries um, because, because uh, we, we've had to, we've had to sort of check the market and, 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 and you know, take a little bit of our put off the accelerator a bit. So that's, that's awesome to hear. And I think that speaks well for how this recovery can happen when CFOs and companies remain as bullish as that sounds. Um, but I, I think it, it, if we focus on our long-term planning, we're definitely spending more time emphasizing um, going deep on multiple scenarios. I, I think, I think you know, it's important because, because there's so much uncertainty. I don't feel like I can say, set the course this way, let's optimize our plan, our capital allocation around the set of assumptions that we really think to, to come to bear. We really need broader aperture on what, on what could happen. Um, and, and I think the important thing there is, is around each of those scenarios, um, you need to understand you know, what levers you can pull if it looks a little different than that. So where can you invest more? Where do you need to invest less to both remain liquid and, and remain um, really competitive? So I, I think the biggest change we've made in our long-term planning is, is, is not really setting a North Star and, and targeting right at that, but really letting all the scenarios travel with us as we go through our, our, our multi-year plan, because it's unlikely that you know, the initial course of steps really gonna be the one that we, we end up on. Um, and I think the other thing that we're, we're, we're trying to do a better job of is, is, is understand what data really matters to the business and what data matters most within these different scenarios. So you know, I was pretty satisfied pre-COVID with data I used to, to make decisions when COVID hit, I realized that a lot of the stuff that I was looking at just didn't matter as much. So I think, you know, the challenge for all of us is to keep, keep saying, is, are the things that I'm looking at today, the things that are going to be relevant to me in all the different scenarios that I could see? Um, and then another thing that I, I think about as we do the long-term planning and even the near-term stuff is, is finance needs to be really, really in with the business as we're trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to, how to plan and how to react. Um, you know, just when you think you, you have all the data in front of you and, and you sort of have what you needed the CFO to do something, um, chances are you're going to get a better perspective if you then go talk to your peers. So an example, uh, when COVID hit, website traffic spiked. We had a bunch of inquiries coming into the top of our marketing funnel. And that looked great. And to me, that says our pipeline is going to look like this. Um, but when I talked to the CMO, I realized a bunch of that's just fluff. People are at home, you know, spending time on the web. So don't think that should be part of your forecast. So I, I think, you know, learning and adapting to, to to taking what you think you know to the business is is one of the pillars of, of how we're going to, I think, be better about our long-term planning. Yeah, and I think, um, Kurt, I'm probably the, the opposite on the increasing operating expenses um, position and only because we cut so deep. So I think it depends on um, how deep you cut initially and how you've operated since then and where your business is now in terms of the recovery. I mean, for us, our business bounced back as soon as states started to open back up and summer travel hit and some people did return to the office we actually saw our revenue pop back up and then we had a different conversation. We we're no longer in COVID triage world. We were in, okay, now what? What are the gates we're gonna put in? Because we definitely don't wanna find ourselves you know, over our ski tips here. 
Um, but we wanted to make sure we were thoughtful in our investments. So we spent the last couple of months actually testing um, so that we could inform that long range um, ramp of operating expenses. And then now we're going through the budgeting to figure out what are the gates? Like, here's the investments we'd like to make. What do we need to see in the business for us to say, yes, gate open, go make that investment now. So we approach it more from a, a gating philosophy, um, at least for until we know where travel and work from home um, environments are gonna land. We, in, in, in healthcare, we saw about 50% of academic <clears throat> and pharma institutions you know, really, you know, pause in terms of getting folks into the office, which inhibits our ability to actually get samples in and um, process samples for, for research uh, results and research revenues, which is a huge driver of our business today and probably less of a driver of our business in the future as we sort of move to more of a, a, a clinical approach uh, to our platform. But sick cancer patients weren't being allowed in either. So on the clinical side, we saw a trough in the business you know, last couple of weeks of March, really with the bottom of that trough in April. And it's been, you know, as things have slowly started to open up and normalize to a certain degree, we've seen a consistent sort of ramp back up to where we were um, at, you know, at the level sort of pre-COVID. What, what, you know, from a, from a planning perspective, I think what this opportunity, you know, don't, don't let a good crisis go to waste. I think you've heard that before. I think, you know, where we've, from, from a CFO perspective, where we've been able to spend some additional dollars investing is really to make sure that we can continue to manage and monitor and you know have oversight over the business through deploying more business intelligence resources at the company. And so instrumenting more of the business and having it be not just a finance and commercial focus uh, with respect to how uh, we lay infrastructure in the company from a BI and BA perspective, are really trying to answer more of the questions and partner more around the company, whether it's lab operations or people and culture team, those are areas that need more resources from us and where we can spend some time investing and where the payoff is going to be long-term and structural, where we, we might as well focus in on it so that when something like this happens again, we can say, hey, what are the bottlenecks in the business? Where are we getting squeezed in resources? You know, are we able to hire just as fast as we predicted? where through the funnel are things breaking. And so instrumenting more of the business um, and helping us resource, you know, the, the questions that are constantly being asked by our partners that need more real time sort of insight is an area that we have been spending a lot of time and focus on and adapting. Yeah. So it was really interesting. It, it sounds like that through, through this crisis, it, um, some of the metrics that you've used to run the business has shifted or maybe been considered differently. Can you share what, what that, you know, I mean, Kurt, you, you mentioned um, uh, uh, people logging on, web traffic going up, but there are there other metrics that significantly changed for, for how you looked at the business? Well, I, I think our top level metrics remain the most important ones that you know, the, the business driving metrics, whether it's customer ads or recurring revenue, things like that. But what it's forced us to do is, is look deeper in the business um, at, at things that might have changed. So, so look deeper at how quickly a sales rep might be, might be ramping. Um, how are the, how are our uh, return on marketing dollars across different channels? Um, different now than they were uh, 12 months right. ago. So it's, it's, more of, it's more of challenging what you think you know about the business and, and what you think is just sort of the, the, the right way that, that your business should run and, and, and revisiting all of that. So it's, it's, I say, I guess it's less about the actual different metrics to look at for us and more about you know, what's, what's, the, what's the data telling us as yeah. to how we should think about the business will react differently in the future. Great. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we're still looking at many similar metrics, but now we're looking at it on a granular, granular level in terms of like state by state as certain states and geographies change their COVID restrictions mm -hmm. and travel starts to come back and, and uh, people are returning to the office. We actually can see now by geography and state, um, how our business will come back by looking at the ones that are opening up faster. But we're also able to see which ones 
potentially are going to um, revert back in the near term. And, and, and in life science it, it, it adaptive, I mean, we're really looking at, you know, how, what the demand is for our products and with, with the health and safety of our employees in mind, how much real capacity do we have at the company to actually al allow us to incubate that throughput, um, bring people in the lab because we're not fully automated and understand, hey, where do we have to get creative in terms of uh, how we set up the lab? Are there different zones that we need to now set up, different teams? Um, how, do we, how do we think about shifts? Um, so there are things like that in terms of our metrics that we're, we're looking at um, that we've instrumented to allow us to make some of those decisions more real time as we start getting more demand for our products, as things start opening up, what does that mean in terms of our available capacity to meet that demand? But also we, we've learned a lot in terms of just pivoting a lot of the company um, to bringing a T cell diagnostic from COVID to market. Um, you know, the infrastructure that we're building as a platform business to enable us to bring that product to market will also enable us to bring the N plus 20 other products to market as well, because it's the same workflow, it's the same infrastructure um, for one product as it would be for any other T cell diagnostic product. So we, we spent a lot of time thinking about hey, how do, you know, how do we tighten up and hasten our ability to bring those products to market where again, the benefit could be, you know, two, three, five years out. Um, but where we are bringing all those resources and, and raising our IQ at that level to a large degree during the crisis. Yeah. Um, uh, Chad, you mentioned a little bit about return to office and so forth. We got a lot of questions on, on this topic. And um, I, I can tell you as a firm, EY has been very intentional about uh, when we return to office. It's all data driven and so forth. In fact, today, not one EY office in the US has reopened. We're all work from home. But we have that luxury, not everyone does. You um, mentioned you had to get in there to run samples and, and so forth, but love to hear from the panelists where, what they are thinking in the short term and eventually in the long term, has this changed your view of, uh, I think Zillow has mentioned 90% of their workforce can, can work from home, but has, how, how are you looking at return to office RTO and, you know, in the short term and the long term? Um, I don't know who wants to take that one first. Kurt? I'll, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, and I've, I've gotten a little feedback that my, my audio is not great, so let me know if that's the, the, the case, but, um, you know, sh short term, I think we've, we've there's been a lot of talk about that. And I, I think, you know, the, the underlying principle, I think for all of us is, um, you know, let's, let's do it in a safe way. Let's do it in a way that works for our employees. Um, but also let's remember that it's not just about being able to return to work. It's about thinking about what are school situations, what are commute situations, all these other factors that aren't just, can we go back to work? Um, but as it, it, we think about the long term, I mean, it, I feel like we're in the middle of this and it's hard to make long-term predictions, but you know, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine um, things ever return exactly to the way they were. Um, I see no reason people are going to dive into traffic at five o'clock in the afternoon, five days a week, just to spend an hour when they could have left at three, if that's, if that's what, they, what they need to do. Um, I know I'm, I'm done with 6 a.m. calls with London uh, in the office. That's, that'll be a thing of the past. Um, and, and I think there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of recruiting advantages too. You know, we're, we're conducting a number of searches right now, but we're thinking differently about where we can target candidates. So, so there's there's a ton of benefit, but um, I'm probably in the camp that that still feels there's going to be a lot of long-term value in getting back to the office at least to some degree um, because of a lot a lot of different things. I think I think the young people, and I always have to challenge myself not to project how I feel with my family here at home in this comfortable situation. I don't want to project that onto the, the young person in New York that has three roommates and can't work out of their, out of their apartment very well. Um, you know, I think we should think about you know, what are the what's the positive value of the social aspect of work. I think it's, I think it's great when employees socialize together. It, it knits them together. It's good for the culture. It's good for employee engagement. And what would be the alternative to that if, if people are never together. Um, and 
you know, I, I also wonder about onboarding. I think it's, we can be effective training new employees, but are they really onboarded into the culture that they would be if they were surrounded by a bunch of people that, that they could really see, you know, how you, how you live a, a, a culture? Um, so I think that's going to be a, a big question for us. And then from a leadership perspective, um, you know, everyone has different styles, but you know, I really value the, the ad hoc around the coffee machine interactions with that person that I might never be on the Zoom with. And, and you know, through those interactions, I feel like I can help them understand who I am, how I lead, what I expect, and in, in a way that I might not be able to communicate in a less or in a more structured way um, with some Zoom interaction. So, yeah. so I think there's going to be a lot of benefits to what we've learned here, but I do look forward to when there can be more human interaction. I 100% yeah, I I agree. I, sorry, I don't know if Tracy, you want to jump yeah. in? Oh, I was going to say I agree in terms of the long-term um, work from home strategy and, and the feelings about um, wanting to, that all the benefits of being in the office, but all the benefits of, of avoiding that 5 p.m. commute. I, I agree and we're at this point, we're surveying our employee base to get their feelings on it as well. And I think, you know, there's no conclusion there in our world, but um, definitely see the pros and cons that Kurt laid out. In the short term, uh, we have definitely erred on the side of safety and health of our employee base. Uh, we actually, the first week of March, sent everybody work from home, had our board meeting work from home um, that week, and really erred on the side of caution and actually very quickly said, we will not re require a return to the office or we'll not even open the office back up uh, more broadly until phase four. Uh, but what we realized since then is all the complexities of people working from home and the hardships and the, yeah, I've got four roommates or, you know, the, the relationship at home is not great. A little separation would, would do well. So right now we're actually working on a hardship proposal that we can um, align with phase three. So still kind of dip our toe under the uh, water for returning the office, but give some relief to those people that are in immense need of it. So. And, and I, I agree with both, both of you. I think uh, just, just to add to that, I think, you know, we do lose something, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, the dynamic nature of a, especially a growth company um, by, by being so separated, access is really uh, impaired, I think, uh, to a large degree. You can't just have a drive-by conversation with somebody, you see they're, they're free. It's, uh, it's almost like a sense of formality to some degree that you have to have when you go virtual or digital that you can dispense with when you're in the office and just walk up to somebody and say, how are you doing? And, hey, have you thought about this? Or let's, let's jump on my whiteboard for a second. So I think there's a sense of, there's a dynamic, collaborative, sort of creative, uh, element that you lose by being separated virtually like we are. Um, so I'm not in the Barton camp of 90%. I'm probably more closer to center, I would guess. Um, still recognizing that we're going to have to be open and I'm going to have to be open to, um, you know, allowing folks to, um, you know, have some degree of flexibility in their workday. And I think that's where we're going to end up. Um, but I think we lose something by not being in, in the office or at least being together. And so for me, as, as Kurt mentioned, the, the, the biggest challenge is onboarding new employees. I think it's really challenging to bring somebody in, integrate them into a team, in an organization, help them understand the mission, how they fit into the broader objectives and the corporate goals, help them to create relationships. That's so hard to do when you're behind a screen like we are. So personally, I've made it a mission for myself to meet with every single employee in my department, at least once a quarter, face to face. And that's like, usually I call them walk and talks. We'll just like grab a mask, you know, go on a walk around Wallingford and just talk about what's on your mind, um, what's happening with the business. But to make that in person connection um, in a safe way um, is really important for me. And when my admin, Macy, has been doing a good job, really nice job trying to schedule these, asking, you know, what my priorities are with employees, I always say, hey, br let me make sure I'm connecting with my new employees first. That's 100% my priorities, because that's the toughest challenge. If they can't sort of see the organization through my lens and for me to help them understand how they can add value to the organization, I, I think it becomes really challenging to make that person effective. Yeah. I, uh, 
are you still hiring at the same uh, projections as you started the year at or for the group? I mean, or are I the numbers still the same or are you, us, we're, you we're, we're, trying, we're trying to, I think operationalizing hiring has been a little more challenging, but the recruiting department has done a fantastic job of creating all the top of the funnel opportunities that we need to bring employees down. Again, it, I think there's just a little more hesitancy as you get towards the end, having not met that person uh, in the analog world or in, the, in real life um, to actually make a decision that might take a little longer and you might have to stress test those decisions, especially as you go further up with more folks on the team. But um, we are make, trying to make as much progress as we can uh, against our uh, forecasts and budgets and trying to incubate, again, everything that we were trying to do uh, this year from a, from a long-term perspective. We definitely are not hiring um, in accordance with our plan, uh, as, you know, given the reduction in force and where we're at and heavily linked to the travel industry and return to office. Um, at this point, we're not. Oh. Yeah, we, we've taken a bit more cautious approach to hiring as well. Just wanting to get a little bit more conviction in what the next quarters and year looks like. So, so we, we've, 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 we've definitely slowed down a little bit, but we have, we've seen the effectiveness of our hiring remain pretty strong. We're just doing a little bit less of it. Less of it. Yeah. How about real estate planning? That's always a great debate is how much, you know, how much will long, the long-term impact be on, on the need for uh, office space? Well, the, Any the, views the, there? The board thinks you can just snap your fingers and, and lower your real estate costs. It's just that easy. <laughs> isn't it? uh, um, we're, we're not, we're trying to not move too fast at this point, just because I, I don't think we, we fully understand what's going to be on the other side of this. Um, it, you know, so, so, but, but I do expect us to just to, to think differently about our office footprint, whether it's entering a new geography um, where we just, you know, by default, get an, get an office. Do we really need that? Um, I think when, when office, when it looks like we're going to be coming up, where we're going to be at, at, at capacity. I think we'll first focus on really um, understanding who needs who needs the same physical footprint and who doesn't. So I think we'll be able to be, become more efficient. Um, I think what's going to be challenging for all of us is is managing the situations where someone says, well, I, I only want to come into the office maybe once or twice a week, but don't give up my office. Um, yeah. That's going to be that's going to be something that I think CFOs who oftentimes manage real estate are, you know, we'll have to wrestle with, and I certainly don't have good answers there. Yeah, we're, we're trying to obviously inc incubate our long-term revenue opportunities that are available to us. And so we've got to take some level of risk with making bets around real estate, especially as it relates to our molecular lab uh, production facility in Seattle, for which, you know, we're, we're now committed to a very large um, build out of capacity and of a new headquarters you know, just off of East Lake, um, you may have seen. And so we're really excited about it. It'll give us an opportunity to really scale up our operations. Um, and, you know, that's something that we're absolutely committed to and focused on is making sure that's a great facility and provides us with enough capacity to prosecute, you know, all the opportunities that we think are, are on the come. And then we have another cellular lab space down in South San Francisco working on another side of the platform related to therapeutics and, and, and personalized drugs. And also that's something else that we're in the midst of building out um, again to open up those opportunities for us from a long-term sort of value creation perspective. And I think for us, we're probably in a different spot. You know, we built out our office space last year, moved in in the fourth quarter. So um, uh, very disappointing that we're not in that amazing space. I mean, we have everything you know, related to dogs, including a dog deck on the 20th floor, um, a little dog park. So anxious to get back in, also cognizant of the fact that we're probably gonna have some space that um, others might find attractive. So shameless plug in case anybody is looking for space <laughs> later this year or early next year. Just yeah. Let me know. Tracy, it was the same with us. We moved into our new office space in November of 19. So, um, yep. Uh, took a long time and a lot of money to get there and now it's not really being utilized so hey uh before we turn it uh back to john to to ask uh, some questions that he's received from the group the audience 
Um, wanted to get your expectations on the larger, larger economy turnaround. Uh, there's a lot happening. Of course, we have the election in November. Uh, there's thoughts of tax, tax escalation from given the amount of debt that many governments have, uh, have had to uh, in, endure. And, you know, there's thoughts about interest rates that, that they could be uh, on the rise. So uh, love to get uh, your views on that. Oh. Anyone? And we're going to write down these predictions, by the way, and then you know, a year from now or two years from now, we're going to we're going to test them. No, just... Well, I can I guess I can um, say that, boy, do I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, you know, given everyone's trying to predict this, I, I, I've looked through a variety of different CEO surveys over um, the last you know, month or two, and they've, they've kind of migrated towards an L or a U-shaped recovery, which is really frustrating um, because L-shaped is several years and U-shaped is one to two years. And I um, actually think the feds gave us an indication of what they're thinking today when they came out and said that they... Uh, likely will not increase interest rates until until we're through 2023. And so um, right now, I think that everyone's landing on this is going to be a multi-year recovery. Um, and it, it's really interesting, though, when I look at the, the markets, right? NASDAQ's up, um, you know, you look at, and it's a tale of two extremes, too. You've got Amazon, DocuSign, Peloton, I mean, I think that um, all told, they almost doubled the enterprise value of those few companies since um, the end of the year, uh, which is amazing. And you can understand why part of it's due to their business performance and, and lending itself to a work from home environment, but part of it's due to the multiples, which is highly linked to the interest rates. Um, and uh, so it looks like that craziness might continue for a period of time. Um, on the other end, you've got the small mom and pops um, that I think are going to be severely impacted and may never recover. So I think this is really a tale of two cities, uh, you know, tale of two extremes here. Um, so it will be interesting. My view is multi-year, different industries will recover at different rates like travel up, my guess is three years. But um, And then corporate taxes, as you talked about, I mean, from an election perspective, We'll see what corporate taxes are next year. We know the two candidates will have dramatically different corporate tra tax programs. So that's my prediction. I, I'm a terrible better when it comes to this stuff. I'm a bad stock picker. Um, I guess I would say that you know mo most crises only last a couple years, at least in, again not having been through a pandemic before. So I'm probably looking at a you know we're probably looking at a couple year recovery. But it's hard to reconcile that with what we're seeing in the public markets. Right, we've had 170 IPOs filed this year. That's up 12% year over year. 122 IPOs priced this year. That's up 7%. 45 billion dollars raised in the public markets. I think through IPOs. That's up 17%. And most of this year, we've been in a pandemic. <laughs> so right. it's it's just wild what's going on. And you're seeing, you know, we all know that it's easier to raise money as a public company than it is a private company. Uh, the, the market's set up for that process to be just more efficient once you're out, even though it costs money to go out and become a public company, it's just much more efficient. And so I think you're seeing a lot of companies just, you know, try to get on the bandwagon. You know, the number of SPACs we've seen in the market has increased significantly. It used to be perceived as a low quality way of sort of becoming public. That's not how it's being perceived any longer. You have some very astute management teams running these SPACs and looking for really interesting targets. And we see them every day. Um, and there's not many disadvantages anymore to, you know, being a SPAC. You can get out in a fraction of the time that it takes for a traditional IPO. Yeah. So, um, you know, Bill Gurley used to say, you know, while the hors d'oeuvres are being passed around, it's time to eat. So I think that's what's <laughs> happening right now. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot, a lot to add. I think those are really good comments. I think what's just interesting to me is to continue to see this disconnect between equity markets and the, you know, the employment markets and the economy generally, um, because I think that, you know, it, it, the closer you look, you, you see so much of the equity markets, I believe, are being, is being driven by, um, it's the only place you can get a return, you know, with, with interest rates near zero and you're searching for, for, for yield, um, you know, 
capital is flowing into, into equity markets and there's still lots of cash on the sidelines. So I think the, the how, how the equity markets reconciles longer term to the overall economy is going to be is going to be really interesting. And I, you know, I, I love the, the course we're on right now and I, I hope it doesn't change. Um, but sometimes it's, it's hard for me to imagine um, sustaining the, the, you know, the, the pace that the equity markets are on while the economy is sort of a different picture. Um, so I, I think that's, that's what I'm, I'm looking at with the same level of interest and no more insight than probably anyone else. I, I, I will say just given my level of sort of skepticism around um, macro just in general, is that from a, you know, I'm, I'm managing nearly a $900 million treasury portfolio at Adaptive. And, um, you know, we have been very cautious around the quality um, and our, our level of risk taking with those investments. So preservation of capital right now is, um, you know, our, our first priority as opposed to anything else, um, yield and, or, or other priorities. And so we are very much so in the camp of let's keep it very safe. We're very heavy into uh, government backed treasuries from money market perspective. And um, we're not taking really any risk with any corporate bonds. Uh, we've seen a number of downgrades over the past you know, few months that have led me to believe that there are further downgrades to come. We've seen things like Disney get downgraded, uh, oil and gas get downgraded. Um, and there might be others to come. So we're rolling, you know, maturities directly back into treasuries as a means of just preserving cash and staying on the staying on the sidelines. And 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 you're not a stock picker, so that's probably I'm the best a, way. I'm to a terrible do stock picker. <laughs> hey, John, I know we went a little longer in this than uh, great. than we have previously discussed. Are there some questions? That Absolutely, you... yeah, great discussion. Thanks, Tracy, Kurt, and Chad. And while Chad might not be a stock picker, he's picked some good bets to go with in terms of companies worked with with Zillow and, and Adaptive, so, so nice bets there. Just kind of building on the economy uh, discussion, we kind of heard Tracy's prediction on an L shape. I kind of want to pin down Kurt and Chad, like if you were to assign a letter here, I mean, what, a U, we hear a K a lot, B, W, what, where, where, where would you put your letter on this recovery? Boy, that's getting really specific. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, I think, I think I, I look at it by, by industry sector, because I think, I think some will outpace others. I mean, I think we're seeing, the tech industry by and large be, be one of the least impacted. And of course, travel, hospitality, and things like that are, 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 are more impacted. So if in your business, you have the opportunity to really orient yourself to the sectors that, that you think are going to return faster, um, you know, I think that's a pretty wise strategy. Um, but but I, I think, you know, I believe in the resilience of this economy. I've, I've you know, been through a couple downturns before and, and somehow we just fight our way back. So I, I have a hard time seeing an L being the outcome here, but um, you know, I think it's gonna be sort of that, 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 that sort of crooked U where we're gonna have some setbacks and we're gonna have some strong quarters, but it's gonna start, it's gonna start climbing up from, from here. Crooked U, Chad, what do you think? I'm, I'm, I like crooked you. That's interesting. <laughs> that one. Yeah, it's definitely not going to be a stair step up into the right uh, whenever we hit, hit the bottom. Um, and again, we have to disassociate, I think, what's happening with unemployment with what kind of behavior we're seeing, uh, maybe irrational behavior we're seeing in the stock market. So, um, you know, maybe some sort of jaggered approach to it. But yeah, tech, tech I think, will mostly weather fine. Um, you know, if you looked at sectors, 50% of all the IPOs this year have been in healthcare. Talk about a, a sector that's in Fuego. Um, there's there's a lot of capital moving into healthcare, um, and there's a lot of momentum um, around um, you know next generation diagnostics, machine learning, and big data in healthcare, and all those big sort of macro factors, which you know, adaptive is playing in a lot of them that are that are um, pushing those healthcare companies up into the right, and where there's a lot of attention and focus now from the capital markets perspective. Yeah, Tim Tasker from EY, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I know you're paying a lot of attention to this as well. Where, where would you put that letter? Well, I, I think a U. Um, it's obviously dependent upon what industry you're in.
but I, I don't know if I'd call it a crooked U. I, I, I think it's more of a, a U shaped. I was uh, earlier in the year, I was thinking V, but, um, and then W, but now I, I'm thinking a little uh, more like a U. Well, things have changed as I posted on Twitter this morning, uh, as I got my hair cut for this session yesterday, that I only anticipated one COVID home haircut, and now I'm on my third. So uh, <laughs> things have certainly changed this year. You got to um, get my hair, dude. That's right. That's right, Tim. <laughs> well, jumping into some audience questions, um, we had a great one come in from uh, Maria Hess, who's a GeekWire member, a partner at Madrona Venture Labs. She was asking, this is kind of in the tools of the trade component of the, of the session here, what are your frustrations with existing solutions for financial planning and analysis? And what financial planning and analysis products could you not live without and why? And Chad, you kind of touched on this. You said you guys were investing a lot more in, in uh, business intelligence. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit about like what's working to help you in your analysis right now. So we, we've made some massive um, investments in terms of I mean, data governance, data security, um, you know, visualization. You know, we, we use Tableau a lot in our day to day and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to, again, hook into all the different production systems that we have, all the various CRMs. So we have a pretty complex um, set of systems, a system, system architecture, system environment at, at Adaptive. And so trying to serve up KPIs, insights, trends, relationships, and patterns, you know, that really help folks make better decisions. It's really trying to marry the, the business intelligence with business process engineering, right? And trying to bring those two things together and bring folks in that not only are really smart and spockish in terms of their analytics, but can take those learnings and translate them into activities to operationalize change in, change in the business. And so for us, that's been in, in, incredibly important, which is to, to connect those, those, those two pieces, the right and left side of your brain, so, so to speak. Um, with, with the right type of, type of talent. Um, I haven't found a panacea with respect to financial planning tools. Um, I've used a, a ton of them. We are still, you know, if we want to do something that's very lightweight, we're still very much an Excel shop. Um, if you want to do something that's much more structural um, and templated um, with probably significantly more integrity in terms of the output, then, you know, we're on, you know, host analytics from that perspective. But in terms of scenario planning and things that are just light, lightweight, um, where we can crank out a new view of a particular scenario or a deal analysis very quickly, we're very much um, sort of still thinking that Excel is the best way to do that. Tracy or Kurt, any add-ons there? I yeah, would well, agree. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, I was Tracy. gonna say I would agree with Chad. I haven't found some amazing uh, solution for uh, financial planning and, and scenario planning. Um, we use Hyperion, and then to Chad's point, if we want to do scenario planning, we do it in Excel. Um, so it is definitely one of my frustrations. And then on the kind of uh, business analytics side, we use Periscope. Um, I, I probably won't go into the, the complexities or frustrations there, but luckily we have a data science team that sits behind it that um, can use that tool and just do amazing analysis. But again, it's more people and systems. Yep, I agree. We have we have a generic planning system, but uh, it, and I swear that question wasn't a plant. But at Appio, our business is providing financial management solutions to technology organizations. So if you need to plan your cloud spend, cloud, plan your SaaS spend, um, or just generally manage your technology investments, uh, Appio.com might be a, a, a place to go. Um, but but, but you know, more more specific to the to the question is is I think where there is the most um, opportunity is in this the, the rapid scenario planning capabilities that I think both Chad and Tracy mentioned that that really aren't accommodated by the typical horizontal financial planning applications. Great, we got a, several questions about the capital markets as well, and just kind of wanted to get a sense of, I mean. Chad, you alluded to kind of how they've really opened up and there's an interest amongst some of the 
entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders out there about how long that might last and, and what the recommendation is for navigating the capital markets right now. Again, really hard to speculate. And I think that's what you're seeing across management teams that you know are looking at the opportunity now and with the amount of capital that's coming in. I mean, the amount of equity deals, we've seen a lot of activity in the convertible debt space. Um, I don't know if there's as much now in the current quarter as there was in prior quarters, but Tim's probably been on a number of those types of deals as, as well. So there are a lot of ways to raise capital in the, in the, in the public markets. Um, and with interest rates as low as they've been, cap, you know, convertible debt um, and uh, senior debt have have been, you know, definitely instruments that um, public companies have been using to to raise to raise additional capital and um, to help help fuel, you know, so the next wave of growth and also provide some balance sheet incubation as well, right? To, to you know, balance sheet insurance. Um, so. As I mentioned, very, very frothy from an IPO perspective. Um, you know, the traditional IPO is being challenged, both as from a, from a time to time to sort of first trade perspective. It can take nine to 12 months from, you know, the, the from when you press start to when you actually, you know, ring a bell. And, you know, SPACs can do that in eight to 12 weeks. At a, at a fraction of the time and with a lower cost of capital. Same thing with d direct listings. You, you seen a lot of mispricings with respect to capital markets. I mean, Snowflake went out just yesterday and a lot of folks are talking about mis, you know, mispricings, leaving a lot of money on the table. And so the cost of capital to somebody like Snowflake is significantly, or the missed opportunity to bring on that additional capital is a real thing. And so there's, there's a lot of um, conventional wisdom that's being challenged with SPACs and direct listings right now. Yeah, we should say SPACs are, for those that don't know, are special purpose acquisition companies, essentially shell companies that can acquire a company and, and take them public very quickly. Uh, Kurt or Tracy, I was just going to give the panel kind of thumbs up or thumbs down on SPACs right now because it's like, it is a very hot topic. Yeah, hey, John, I, I would just add on uh, SPACs year to date are up 32% over all of 19 and so it is a, a it, which is a pretty legitimate transaction at this point. And and I, if I read it correctly, I thought the average uh, was around 400 million. So as Chad mentioned, they were in the past kind of viewed as an end around, but today they are, and there are tons out there. We are working on a lot of them right now um, for the reasons Chad mentioned. So there's a new vehicle that's, uh, I wouldn't say it's new, it's been around for quite a long time. And if, and if you're a board member you and look and you're working at a private company and you're thinking about paths to go public, you've got to have that conversation about SPACs and direct listings. And so that puts some more onus on the board to actually spend the time thinking about non-traditional paths to going public um, because of the, the level of certainty that you get from a SPAC, for example, related to pricing, related to valuation. Um, you don't look, no longer have to take that risk with an IPO roadshow. The costs are significantly less. And so you're going to be seeing and hearing about more SPACs, um, I think, in the future. I, I think it's, it's to Tim's point, they've, they've been legitimized through the past six months. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're almost at time here. I don't don't think I want to end in the weeds on SPACs. Uh, so let's, let's end on something um, as maybe a little bit more forward looking. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll ask two questions. And I'll just open up the panel as we finish it up. W what are the permanent changes that COVID has created for you as a CFO? And if you don't want to take that one, maybe a silver lining that you've discovered amid all the chaos. I would love to take that one. Jump uh, in. I, I think silver lining for Rover pet adoptions through the roof. And our mission is to help everyone know the love of a pet. And I mean, I can't bring up social media without seeing a dog being adopted, a cat being adopted, shelters are out of pets. And so um, silver lining for us is our business is going to emerge stronger than ever um, coming out of this pandemic. We can't, we don't know the exact timing, but I'm 150% confident that we have a better business post COVID than we did pre COVID. So. For us, it's been around the level of focus that we brought to bringing products to market 
and you know, creating all that workflow and infrastructure that I, again will be as a platform business will be layered into every other additional product that comes out of adaptive in the future. I think for us, it, 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 the shock to the system of COVID forced us to rethink everything we do in a way that we would never would have done organically just through, you know, trying to force continuous improvement into the business. You know, we had to rethink, you know, you know, where, where we put employees, how we employ technology to get people successful, different sales and marketing processes. So we're, we're going we're gonna to have come through this, essentially, uh, this, 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 this crisis management exercise in a way that's you know, forced us to rethink things that we never would have otherwise, and I think we'll be better for it. Tim Tasker, any silver linings for you? For us, I, I think it's throughout this, um, pandemic, we've been able to serve our clients at the same level um, that we have in the past. Um, and, and I think that is proof of the model that we are in and how we operate and being able to, to do it all virtually has, has, been, uh, has been fantastic while keeping our people safe. So. Well, great. Well, with that, we're going to conclude today's session. Uh, again, a big thanks to Aptio and EY for their great support on this session. And also thanks to Tracy, Kurt, Tim, and Chad. Great stuff. Um, for those who are on, we will be making the recording available to you uh, who've tuned in and to those who registered in case you missed components of it. So we'll get, be getting that sent out to you here shortly. One last reminder, GeekWire Summit is coming up next month. So geekwire.com slash summit. And with that, I'm going to say farewell from the GeekWire headquarters here in Seattle's uh, beautiful Fremont neighborhood. Thanks for joining us, everybody.